So thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting me to speak. Uh, so in this talk, um, all of the representations uh, will be complex representations. Okay, um, and to remind everyone, uh, the character of a representation row, like let's say of a finite group, is the function from the group to complex numbers defined by um, taking the trace of a row of G. Okay, and since we're taking the trace, uh, characters are class functions. So they are constant unconsciously classes. And another basic fact is that uh, the number of irreducible representations of a finite group equals the number of conjugacy classes of that group. Okay, so you can um, organize all of the data of the values of the irreducible characters of your group um, in a square table uh, called the character table. Okay. So this will be the uh, character table uh, of our group G. And to fix conventions, we'll label the uh, columns by the consciousness class. And we'll label the rows by uh, irreducible representations. And where um, a row uh, corresponding to an irreducible representation meets a column corresponding to the consciousness class. We'll put the value of the character corresponding to the irreducible representation evaluated at the consciousness class uh, C. And in the uh, particular case we care about in this talk, G is the symmetric group on N letters. Um, and then the consciousness class, um, the consciousness classes of the symmetric group are one-to-one -one correspondence with the cycle types of permutations. Mm -hmm. And uh, cycle types um, are then in one-to-one -one correspondence by just taking the sizes of the cycles with partitions of n. Okay, so that is decreasing sequences of positive integers Uh, that sum to n, and then we write lambda and then this symbol n to mean that lambda is a partition of n. And there is also a natural and beautiful one-to-one uh, -one correspondence between irreducible representations of Sn and uh, partitions of n. Uh, via uh, spec modules. And uh, in this talk, um, we will denote the character value uh, for the irreducible representation corresponding to a partition lambda of n, evaluated at the consciousy class corresponding to the partition mu of n at chi sup lambda sub mu. Uh, yeah, so these are like the notations for the talk. Uh, so next I have an example of a character table of symmetric group. Uh, so here is the character table of S5. Um, so here I've labeled the um, irreducible representations and the consciousy classes with uh, the uh, corresponding partitions of five. So there are five partitions of five, here they all are. Or sorry, there are seven partitions of five, here they all are. So this is like a seven by seven table. Um, and uh, okay, I think one thing you might notice is that all of the entries of the character tables are integers. And this is not like in general true for character tables of like any finite group, um, but it turns out to always be the case 
um, for uh, character tables of symmetric groups. So it is a general fact. that the character values chi lambda mu, um, uh, the symmetric group, uh, this is always an integer. And this is the case for Sn for all n. It wasn't just something for S5. And uh, if you're a number theorist, like a kind of natural question to ask, um, if you are presented with these um, large arrays of integers is to ask, like, what are the statistical properties of these integers as n tends to infinity? Okay, so uh, what are the statistical properties of the character table entries? for Sn as n tends to infinity. Okay. Um, so Alex Miller in 2017 um, computed uh, the whole character table of Sn um, for n up to 38. and also computed um, the parity of all of the character values for n up to 76. Okay, and then he looked at kind of uh, various, uh, um, I guess arithmetic questions about the distribution of these uh, care of the entries in the character table, um, and the I guess the most basic question you can ask is like as n tends to infinity, uh, what proportion of entries are even and what proportion are odd. Uh, so here I have a graph uh, taken from Alex's paper um, uh, that plots the proportion of entries of the character table of S n that are um, even. Um, for all n between 1 and 76. Okay. Um, I guess this is pretty suggestive. Uh, and next I have um, another table taken from Alex's paper uh, in which he um, looks at how many or what proportion of entries of the character table of Sn for n up to 38 are divisible by small prime powers. Um, so we looks mod uh, powers of two, three, and five, uh, like up to the third power. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, I mean, uh, it's really difficult computationally to go much beyond 38. Like, first of all, the, uh, the size of the character table grows so quickly as n increases, like, Pretty soon, I mean, probably at like 40, you can't even like fit the entire thing in your computer. Um, and even kind of the, uh, like even if you wanted to like compute a like random uh, uh, character value, um, this also like, takes a pretty long time typically, it seems. Um, but at least based on this small amount of data, um, uh, Miller made uh, the beautiful conjecture oh I don't know what happened that as uh, n tends to infinity uh, almost all of the entries in the character table of SN are even okay so he conjectured that n tends to infinity the uh, proportion of odd values in the character table tends to zero. Okay. And uh, 
So this was like also a reasonable thing to conjecture because uh, we've known since the 70s that it's true um, in the first column of the character table. So for the degrees of the irreducible representations. And this was shown by Mackay. Uh, this was 1972. That the character values chi, lambda, and then the partition of all ones, uh, which just gives you the degree of the irreducible representation is almost always even. And he, in fact, uh, found a formula for the uh, number of um, odd degree irreducible representations. Um, and then following Miller's conjecture, some partial progress was made. Um, by uh, Gluck and Morodi. Okay. Um, and then in 2020, I was able to confirm that this conjecture is true. Okay, so uh, almost every entry in the character table of SN is even. Uh, so in the same, in the same paper, um, Miller made the more general conjecture that the same holds for any prime. Okay, so now fix P, and we have the same thing as N tends to infinity, almost every entry uh, in the character table of SN uh, is a multiple of P. Um, and uh, this was proved by Sound and I. And also with the degree of uniformity quantitatively in the prime P. Um, Okay. So then in a later paper, Miller made the even more general conjecture that the same thing holds for all prime powers. Okay, so we'll fix now Q is a prime power. And again, as M tends to infinity, almost every entry of the character table of SN is a multiple of Q. And the uh, topic of my talk today is about a proof of uh, sound in me of this most general of Miller's conjectures. Uh, so precisely what we prove Uh, is like first let's let n be large. So just larger than some absolute constant so that all the logs and log logs occurring in our proof are actually defined. Okay, so we'll let n be large. Um, and so we also can get a degree of like quantitative uniformity in this uh, argument as well. And so then we let q be a prime power. Uh, that's at most like 10 to the minus three log n over uh, like log log n squared. Uh, so q be a prime power. So then um, the um, proportion of entries in the character table of SN not divisible by Q is uh, like big O of uh, E to the minus uh, log log N squared. Okay. Um, 
So then by the union bound as a corollary, we get that if you fix any, uh, in a, any natural number, like say K, then as n tends to infinity, almost all entries of the character table symmetric group are divisible by that K. So before, before we had this for prime powers, we could only do it for like K square free. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll pause here for a second to see if there's any questions about like, the statement of the theorem. Okay, uh, and I assume there are no questions. Uh, so I'll start talking about the proof. And the proof um, relies on combining like four uh, key intermediate results, uh, which I'll tell you. Um, so the first, is a lemma um, uh, which we call the combining parts lemma. Okay, if you've seen me talk about the prime stuff, this is just a more general version of the combining parts lemma from my previous talks. Uh, so it says that we let P to the R uh, be a, a prime power. Okay, uh, then we assume that um, mu is a partition of n and that nu is another partition of n um, that is obtained um, from mu by replacing um, p to the r parts of the same size, uh, let's say M uh, in mu by P to the R minus one parts of size uh, P times M. Uh, so same total number of, um, of numbers for like uh, same total size of the parts, though P to the R times M. Um, but now I've combined them into uh, p to the r minus one parts. Um, so then uh, the character values for mu and nu are the same mod p to the r. So chi lambda mu is then congruent to chi lambda nu mod uh, p to the r. Okay, so then I guess this is the case for all partitions lambda then. Okay, so for it, for an example of what this combining parts operation is, um, so here we'll take uh, the prime power to be four. Uh, so then the character values chi lambda um, three one 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 one. So four ones. These are the same as um, when we combine the four ones in the partition three one 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 into two parts of size two. So same mod four for all character values. Okay. Um, so for the people who know like a bit about the representation theory of SN, uh, the way that this lemma is proven, uh, it's really not hard. You just reduce the polynomials uh, appearing in Frobenius's formula for character values uh, mod p to the r. Okay. So this is not very difficult. Okay. Um, but to tell you about uh, the next three lemmas, uh, I'm gonna have to introduce a bit of, uh, I guess, definitions, notations. Uh, having to do with uh, uh, partitions. Okay. Um, so for any um, partition, uh, you can form the associated Young diagram, um, which is just like a left justified um, collection of boxes um, with each row containing number of boxes of the corresponding part of the partition. So for four, two, one, we get the Young diagram. Okay. 
with four boxes in the first row because there's like uh because the first part or the largest part is size four then two boxes in the second row and then one box in the third so this is the young diagram of the partition four to one um and each box in a young diagram has a corresponding hook okay and this, this will be a definition by example um so i'm gonna just redraw young diagram above i guess i could have copied it because this is an ipad um and then um, the hook for a box, so say this box in the like upper left-hand corner, is the uh, collection of all boxes um, to the right of the box in the same row. So all these boxes, along with the boxes and the same column um, below. So all these boxes I've drawn blue through um, uh, form the hook corresponding to uh, this box. Okay. And uh, the length of a hook is just the number of boxes in it. So this is a hook of length, uh, there are six boxes, so this hook has length six. Okay. And for example, I guess, uh, so this hook, as length four. And you can do that with any box in the Young diagram. Um, so if you have a partition of n, um, the Young diagram has n um, different hooks. And we say that a partition is a T core um, if none of its hooks. Have length a multiple of t. Okay, so you can check that um, uh, this partition four to one is a five core. Okay, so longest hook has length six, and you won't find a hook of length five um, in the diagram. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's the definition of T-core. And the next uh, key intermediate result, the lemma that says that um, almost every uh, partition lambda of n is a T-core when T is large. Okay. Um, so because we do things quantitatively, we'll let L be some um, parameter, which if you just care about a um, fixed prime power, like you can just take L to be some sufficiently large constant. So if you want to prove the result mod four, you could take L to be 25. Um, so then for any natural number T, Um, of size at least one plus one over L times square root of six over two pi square root of N log N. Um, all but, oh, I don't know what happened there. Uh, all but um, a, a big O of uh, log N over and to the one over two L proportion. Um, of partitions of N. Are T cores. Okay. Uh, yeah, so maybe I'll give you some context for like this, this lower bound. Um, Okay. So the uh, expected largest part of a random partition of n is 
is uh, asymptotically uh, square root of six over two pi uh, square root of n log n. Okay, so um, uh, yeah, that's exactly what appears here. So this is saying if t is like substantially larger than the uh, typical largest part of a random partition, then almost all um, partitions of n are t cores. Okay, so that's that's what's meant by if t is large. Okay, uh, so this is the second um, kind of key intermediate result, and the third is the like um, like the uh, kind of key new input into the argument that let us do prime powers instead of just primes. And it's a new um, divisibility uh, condition um, for a character value um, uh, and a prime power. So this is the divisibility condition. Okay, so we'll let M1 to MR. Um, just be distinct natural numbers. And we'll assume that mu is a partition of n, and it has parts of sizes m1 up to mr. Hi, Sarah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, oh, yeah. but uh, there's a question in the chat. What a question whether you could just provide a, an idea of how to prove the lemma for T core partitions. Oh, um, yeah. So for this, um, I guess there's a couple different ways you can do it. I guess you can use like if you wanted even more information about the distribution of like the number of T cores, you could use like um, Hans like. Uh, like generating function identity for um, uh, T core partitions. Um, or, I mean, there are just some, I guess, basic inequalities, um, like for the number of T core partitions that you can just plug in the asymptotic for the number of partitions of N into, I guess, the number of partitions of N and then the number of partitions of N minus T and like mess around with basic facts about T cores to get this. Yeah, so this is not a like difficult lemma. Uh, Thank you. So, yeah, I hope this is helpful. Uh, okay, so, um, so for the divisibility condition, okay, which is like much, much harder to prove. Um, this is where like most of the work of the proof goes into. Um, so we have uh, distinct um, positive integers and M1 up to MR, and then mu is a partition of N um, with parts of size, um, with parts of these sizes, um, uh, all appearing with multiplicity at least um, P to the R, uh, sorry, P to the R minus one. So each appearing. At least P to the R uh, minus one times in mu. So then if lambda is a partition of n and it is a, I guess, simultaneous sum ki mi core partition um, for all R tuples of Ks um, such that the Ks are non-negative integers um, between uh, uh, zero and R minus one, um, who that sum to at least P to the R minus one. So if uh, lambda is a simultaneous um, this quantity core for all of this many uh, R tuples, then um, 
the character value chi lambda mu is a multiple of p to the r. Okay, and uh, yeah, I will postpone saying anything about this proof until the end, and then only if I have time. Okay, um, so now I've told you like three, the three intermediate results, three of, out of the four. The first one says we can do this like combining parts operation and um, not change the uh, congruence class mod p to the r of our character values. Um, so we might as well combine all the parts as we can, all the parts that we can until we can't combine any more parts. So nothing appears um, more than, um, or nothing appears at least p to the r times. Um, and then um, it's, I think then reasonable to guess that if you combine parts in this way, that you'll end up with many kind of largish parts, m1 f to mr, that appear with large multiplicity, um, and that the m1 up to mr are large enough so that this quantity is sufficiently large that almost all partitions lambda are um, this quantity core partitions. So then um, uh, the next uh, key intermediate result is that we show that this is the case. Okay, so we show that this combining parts operation leads to um, many large parts, as many largish parts, with large multiplicity, it's largish multiplicity. be more consistent with my, I guess, vague notions of large. Okay, so what we show is that, um, like starting with a typical partition of N, if you combine parts in the way that I told you from the first lemma, um, until you can't anymore, then you're gonna have enough largest parts to satisfy the divisibility condition, um, or so that typical lambda satisfy the divisibility condition from the previous lemma. Okay, so um, starting with a partition mu of n, we repeatedly replace every occurrence of p to the r parts the same size m by p to the r minus one parts of size p times m. We do this until we arrive uh, at a partition mu tilde, also of n, um, in which no part appears uh, p to the r times. So you can't combine parts anymore. Okay, so then, except for a uh, this big O of e, uh, to the minus n over uh, n to the one over uh, some constant depending on p to the r um, proportion of uh, initial partitions mu. Um, mu tilde has um, the parts we want. So it has at least r distinct parts. Uh, let's say m sub j, um, each appearing 
um, at least p to the r minus one times. And satisfying um, p to the r minus one times m and j is at least um, a good bit larger than um, the typical largest part of a random uh, partition of n. Okay, and this is good enough to make the whole argument work. Um, yeah, so the proof of this um, is uh, we, pit, we can uh, create a kind of a convenient generating function whose terms are an upper bound for the number of like bad um, partitions mu. So those such that mu tilde like doesn't have this nice property. And um, yeah, we pick this convenient generating function in such a way that we can kind of more easily evaluate um, or more easily like upper bound its coefficients, which then would give us an upper bound in the number of bad um, partitions uh, mu. Uh, okay, um, so now that I've told you the, I guess, four key intermediate results, I'll just give like now, or at least write down an outline of the proof, which I guess I've said verbally. Okay, um, so first, by repeatedly doing the combining parts operation, the first lemma tells us that the uh, columns of the character table corresponding to mu and mu tilde are a congruent mod p to the r. Okay, so then it suffices to show um, that almost every um, partition mu um, character values chi, lambda, mu tilde are almost always um, multiples of p to the r. Okay, so then by um, combining the divisibility condition, with the fact that almost every lambda um, is a T4 for T large. It then suffices to show that mu tilde um, has many large -ish parts. with uh, high multiplicity. Okay, but this is exactly what the, uh, the last time I showed you said. Okay, this is uh, the lemma I labeled that combining parts leads to uh, many large-ish parts with uh, high multiplicity. Um, yeah, so these are how the different parts of the proof fit together. And it seems like I have enough time to say a bit about the divisibility condition and its proof, which is like, yeah, this was the really fun part. Um, so first I'll tell you about um, the murnahan yakiyama rule. which is a uh, recursive formula for computing um, character values of the symmetric group. Um, and first I need a bit more it's notation. So um, here's the Young diagram of the partition 333, three, three, or it will be. So it'll be like a three by three uh, collection of boxes. Um, and so here, uh, 
we have a hook of length four. And so any hook um, touches like two boxes or at least two boxes on the boundary of the uh, um, Young diagram. So we have the box all the way um, to the right on the horizontal arm. And then we have the box like all the way at the bottom on the vertical arm. And we can also connect these two boxes along the boundary of the uh, Young diagram. Okay, so right here we have a hook in blue, and then we have the corresponding border strip. Um, BS of H, where we connect the ending parts of the hook along the border strip or along the border of the Young diagram. And um, for any hook, um, there's another quantity associated to it called the height of the hook, which is just the number of box or the number of rows the hook goes through minus one. Uh, so this hook has height equal to two because it goes through one, two, three rows. Um, so then we subtract one to get a height of two. Um, and the Murnahan Nakayama rule says, um, so if we let sigma be a permutation um, that factors as product of two um, permutations, one of which is a T cycle. And then tau can be whatever else, but the supports have to be disjoint. Then right, partition lambda of n, the character value uh, chi lambda of sigma is a sum over all hooks in the Young diagram of lambda of length t, negative one to the height of the hook. Um, and then the character value chi, um, uh, the character corresponding to the partition whose Young diagram you get by removing the corresponding border strip um, from the Young diagram of lambda, evaluated at tau. Okay, so both of these, um, so this is now a um, partition of n minus t, and this has a or corresponds to a, also a partition of n minus t. Okay, so it gives you character values of Sn in terms of character values of like Sn minus t. This is why it's like recursive. Okay, so it can give you like a very, okay, I guess very vague sketch of the proof. Of the divisibility condition And it's, um, it's basically just a repeated applications of the following lemma. Does a lot of the work in the proof. Um, so now more generally, we let sigma be a, a permutation in SN of the form tau times now a product of um, Ooh, maybe you can't see this, p to the r minus one um, uh, t cycles and um, all of the supports of these uh, permutations are disjoint. Okay, so now um, we let for any lambda partition of n, we'll let L denote the set of partitions uh, lambda prime of 
n minus um, p to the r minus one times t uh, that you can obtain by removing p to the r minus one border strips from lambda of length t. Okay, so then lambda is a partition of n. Oh no, I already said that. So then if lambda is a p to the r minus one times t core, then character value chi lambda sigma is the prime p times some sum of character values over L. It ends up being an integer uh, linear combination of these character values. Okay, so then, okay, we've now gotten that some character value is um, multiple of P. And then the idea is to like repeatedly apply this lemma I guess you apply it r many times um, to get di uh, divisibility by p to the r. And um, the existence of this complicated looking like hook condition in the divisibility um, criterion uh, basically comes from having to ensure that this always holds. Okay, so another part of the proof of the divisibility condition is checking that if you like make this complicated core assumption on your initial lambda, then even when you remove like um, many different parts, you still know that it's a I guess, T prime core for enough T primes that you can apply this lemma. And the proof of this lemma was very fun. Uh, basically the way it works is you apply, because you have um, P to the R minus one T cycles, uh, you apply the Murnahan Nakayama rule, um, P to the R minus one many times. Um, so then you definitely end up with a uh, linear combination of um, character values of this form, um, right? Because these are just the character values corresponding to lambda that you get by removing p to the r minus one border strips of length t from lambda. And this is what the Murnat Nakayama rule like has in its recursion. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the thing you have to show is that each one of these appears with um, both the same sign and a multiple of p many times. And to do this, it's kind of this um, a very combinatorial argument using uh, the abacus representation of um, partitions. And yeah, that's definitely that's all I'll say about um, the proof. Uh, I want to end with there's still kind of many interesting opening questions um, about the character values of the symmetric group. Um, so I'm going to highlight two of these uh, suggested by Miller's data. Um, so the first is a question of what proportion um, of the character table of SN is positive or negative. Okay, um, so based on this data, Miller conjectured that um, the proportion of positive and negative values should be uh, roughly equal. And then related to this is the question, which is the most interesting question to me, of how many zeros are in the character table of SN? So what proportion of the character table of Sn is just zero. And uh, for the second question, um, I'll show you some data in a second, but it's like, I think, yeah, it's hard to guess like what the answer should be um, based on the data. Uh, but I'll say that like obtaining um, for this one, getting at least a constant 
uh, times one over log n proportion um, is pretty easy. Um, you can just use, there's this like old result of Erdős and Lehner about the distribution of the largest part of a random partition of n. Uh, so you can combine this um, with the Murnan Nakayama rule and the fact that, or the quantitative version of um, almost all, all partitions of n are t cores when t is large to get this uh, one over log n proportion of zeros. And I think this is the best known. I don't think this has been improved uh, at all. Um, okay, so yeah, I like these questions. And here's some more um, data I stole from Alice's papers. So this one, uh, this is the uh, graph of the, um, or it plots both the um, uh, density of positive character values in this set of non-zero character values, and the same for negative, um, in the character table of uh, SN for all n between 1 and 38. Um, and yeah, you can see they both appear to be approaching 1 half. And so this is actually from a different paper of Miller's that's on the archive. Like maybe this was like the, the original version of um, the one that ended up published. And uh, here is also um, the data for the proportion of zeros in the character table of uh, SN for N up to 38. Yeah, I think here it's really hard to tell like, yeah, what's going on? Like is, the density of zeros approaching some positive constant or is it decaying like one over log n to zero? Um, yeah, who knows? Uh, so that's all I have.